Hi, I'm Tom Crook. I'm a lecturer in modern British history at Oxford Brookes University and I'm here to talk about the corruption of British politics. One of the charges made against the political classes in Britain today is that they are corrupt, that government ministers and MPs regularly abuse their public office in order to advance either their own personal interests or the interests of their friends and family and their political allies and party donors. Is there any truth in this charge? I think there is. We need to be careful about how we use the term corruption. For one thing, I don't think we can, as yet at least, point to what we might call systemic corruption. A corruption so endemic that it implicates the majority of our ministers and MPs. We have, it should be said, seen this in the past, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, when public office was dominated by the aristocracy, when there was no distinct civil service as such, and when the tiny minority who possessed the vote were often bribed and intimidated at the polls. We need, in other words, to keep things in perspective. Corruption is a problem in British politics today, but it's not as pervasive as it has been in the past. Secondly, we also need to be clear about what today's corruption consists of and ultimately what's at stake. Now, one way to think about corruption is as a particular piece of wrongdoing, an act of bribery, for instance, or an act of fraud. Let me be clear, this kind of corruption has taken place in British politics in recent decades. In the 1970s, it was discovered that a leading government minister and two MPs had received bribes as part of a network of contacts put together by the businessman John Paulson. In the 1990s, it was found that a small number of MPs had accepted, or were prepared to accept, cash payments in order to ask questions in Parliament. In 2011, six MPs were jailed for defrauding the House of Commons expenses system. However, this isn't the key problem today. The biggest problem today, as it has been since the early 20th century, concerns conflicts of interest. These are best thought of as situations rather than discrete acts, as relationships and connections which might, just might, lead to the judgment of a public office holder being impaired so that he or she thinks first and foremost not of the public interest but of their own interests or those of their friends, allies and donors. In other words, relationships and connections which might lead to their judgment being corrupted. Now, conflicts of interests are difficult to avoid in politics. Ministers and MPs require allies. They have friends and family. Parties require donors. Governments are lobbied by firms seeking contracts and changes to the law. I might go on. What's more, it's difficult to prove that someone's judgment has in fact been impaired. We can't, after all, tell what's going on inside someone's head. But this is precisely why there exist detailed regulations and codes of conduct expressly designed to help ministers and MPs avoid both actual and apparent conflicts of interest. And the general rule is that if they can't avoid these conflicts, then they must declare and register them. So what's the problem of corruption today? The problem today is that ministers, and to a lesser extent MPs, have developed an entirely cavalier attitude towards conflicts of interest, as if they didn't exist, as if the rules and regulations don't apply to them. It's not a new problem, but it's one which has got much worse in the past decade. Let me give you some examples from Boris Johnson's time as Prime Minister. The award of a peerage to a former Conservative Party treasurer and party donor, Peter Credas, despite being advised not to do so by the House of Lords Appointments Commission. Or again, the reliance on party allies to fund the refurbishment of the Downing Street flat, as well as two foreign holidays. These examples attach specifically to Johnson, but others extend much beyond him. The award of PPE contracts worth hundreds of millions of pounds during the Covid crisis to firms whose owners had connections to the Conservative Party. The undeclared lobbying of senior ministers by the former Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron on behalf of a company, Green Sill, in which he had a significant financial interest of his own. Many more examples might be provided, but together they amount to an unprecedented disregard for basic rules designed to safeguard probity in public office and uphold public trust. The phrase often used to describe this is cronyism, but it's also a form of corruption. How can we explain this? Simple moral failings on the part of individuals are a crucial part of the explanation. 
but so too are more structural developments that have taken place since the Thatcher administrations of the 1980s. The centralisation of power in number 10, the growing influence of special advisers, consultants and professional lobbyists in Westminster and Whitehall, the now entrenched use of private profit-making companies to deliver public services, the revolving door between ministerial office and positions in the private sector. None of these developments have necessarily caused the kind of corruption we see today, but they have made the moral failings of individuals both more likely and more consequential. Finally, we might ask, what difference would a new government make? One would hope that rules would be tightened and that they would be followed more diligently. But until some of the factors I mentioned a moment ago are properly confronted and addressed, we can, I fear, expect to see more of the same. And the charge of corruption will continue to haunt British politics.